amnesia on Russia fever, critics say. There was no Russian fever in June 2016, Donald Trump Jr. says now, as he tries to justify his meeting with a Kremlin-connected lawyers who promised dirt on Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton. President Donald Trump has repeated the talking point in defending his eldest son. And you have to understand, when that took place, this was before Russia fever, Trump told Reuters in an interview Wednesday. There was no Russia fever back then, that was at the beginning of the campaign, more or less. There was no Russia fever. Just the day before Trump Jr. received the email promising dirt, however, Clinton had devoted significant time in a major foreign policy speech to slamming Trump's warmth toward the Russian regime. Indeed, for months Trump critics had been questioning why the candidate was so full of praise for Russian President Vladimir Putin. And he said if he were grading Vladimir Putin as a leader, he'd give him an A. Now, I'll leave it to the psychiatrists to explain his affection for tyrants, Clinton said in the June 2nd speech. I just wonder how anyone could be so wrong about who America's real friends are. Because it matters. If you don't know exactly who you're dealing with, men like Putin will eat your lunch. And for months, questions had already been swirling around Trump's campaign chairman at the time, Paul Manafort, who had significant ties to pro-Russian politicians in Ukraine. As early as February 2016, Trump had noted in a speech that Putin called me a genius a compliment he would repeat again and again throughout the campaign. While it wasn't revealed until mid-June by the Democratic National Committee that Russia was behind the hack of its servers, the idea that Russia was off the radar when Trump Jr. took the meeting struck many as strange, especially Trump's critics. I'm not sure how it's a defense, even if you accept the premise that the attention on Russia was not as pointed as it became, said Brian Fallon, Clinton's former campaign press secretary. The criticisms still apply in terms of he was presented with an invitation to a meeting with someone who was described as a Russian government lawyer. But even with that, Fallon said, I don't agree with the premise. There was already a lot of skepticism about Donald Trump's repeated expressions of favorable sentiments toward Putin and Russia. The question of whether or not Russia was on center stage struck many as irrelevant. The notion that it wasn't at the national level yet strikes me as untrue but I don't see the connection between that claim and trying to find some sort of exculpatory rationale for taking this meeting," said Ned Price, a former CIA officer and National Security Council spokesman in the Obama administration. It's really irrelevant. Regardless of the media environment, Price said, to take a meeting with a self-professed agent of the Russian government remains potentially a crime. Longtime Russia watchers also said there was plenty of scrutiny around the Kremlin and its intentions toward Trump around the time of the controversial meeting. My own sense is that there was concern in the summer, said Harley Balser, a former Georgetown University professor and director of the school's Center of Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies. I think the fever is a result of repeated denials that were revealed to be lies. Indeed. The Russia storm that Trump labels fake news and a witch hunt was brewing strongly by the late summer of 2016. Former CIA director Michael Morrill took to the pages of the New York Times to raise the alarm about Trump's attitude toward Russia that August, painting a picture of just how long the Russia trouble had been in the works. President Vladimir V. Putin of Russia was a career intelligence officer, trained to identify vulnerabilities in an individual and to exploit them. That is exactly what he did early in the primaries. Mr. Putin played upon Mr. Trump's vulnerabilities by complimenting him. He responded just as Mr. Putin had calculated, Morrill wrote. Of course, the issue has only taken on more prominence in recent months as the intelligence community concluded Russia waged an influence campaign to help elect Trump and a special prosecutor investigates whether the Trump campaign colluded in the effort. The White House did not respond to a request for comment. Trump misstates details to paint pipelines as tool to fight Russia. President Donald Trump misstated key details about an oil pipeline he approved to present the project as part of a strategy to undercut Russia. Dakota Access takes it to the Pacific, Trump told reporters on Air Force One on Wednesday night, 
according to excerpts released by the White House of what was originally an off-the-record conversation. Who do they compete with? Russia. It was not immediately clear what Trump meant, but the Dakota Access Pipeline does not go anywhere near the Pacific coast. It starts in the back in oil field in North Dakota and runs east to Patoka, Illinois, where it links up with an existing pipeline network. The White House did not respond to a request for comment. Trump also touted the Keystone XL pipeline, saying he revived it on day one. That's not quite right, either. Trump signed memos expediting Doblin KXL four days after being sworn in, and it was two more months before the State Department formally approved Keystone's permit. TransCanada is awaiting approval from state regulators in Nebraska before it can begin construction on the project. But that goes to the Gulf, right? Competes with Russia, Trump said of the KXL pipeline. Trump also said Keystone XL and Doppler would create a combined 48,000 jobs without addressing the temporary nature of most of that work. Doppler operator Energy Transfer Partners said up to 12,000 jobs would be supported while the pipeline was under construction, but that work has already been completed. Just 40 permanent jobs are expected to remain, according to estimates from the Brookings Institution. The State Department estimated Keystone XL would support around 42,000 direct and indirect jobs during its assumed two years of construction and a total of 50 permanent jobs after that. The president also stressed his support for increased oil and gas drilling, although there, too, he overstated the case. We've got underneath us more oil than anybody, and nobody knew it until five years ago, Trump said inflating the relative size of U.S. reserves and reducing the amount of time companies have been able to access it. And I want to use it. And I don't want that taken away by the Paris Accord. In 2016, the IA ranked the U.S. 11th in proven crude oil reserves, behind Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Canada and others. The hydraulic fracking and horizontal drilling technology that helped U.S. oil companies unlock massive new stores of oil and gas from shale formations has been widely used for at least a decade, helping spark a huge uptick in oil production since 2009. Trump also called himself a tremendous fracker and alleged energy prices would have doubled if former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had won the election, alleging she would have banned fracking. Clinton never supported a fracking ban during the campaign, despite heavy pressure from liberal activists, though she did call for increased regulation of the technology. As Secretary of State, she established the Global Shale Gas Initiative promoting natural gas development. Trump also said he was seriously considering putting solar panels on the border wall he would like to build. There is a chance that we can do a solar wall. We have major companies looking at that. Trump's outside attorney to apologize to men he sent profane emails. President Donald Trump's outside attorney Marcus Oates will apologize to a man he told in a profanity-laced email to watch his back, a spokesman said Thursday. Mr. Kasowitz, who is tied up with client matters, said he intends to apologize to the writer of the email referenced in today's ProPublica story, spokesman Mike Siderick said. While no excuse. The email came at the end of a very long day that at 10 p.m. was not yet over. ProPublica published an email exchange earlier Thursday between Kasowitz and a retired public relations professional who asked not to be named. In the exchange, Kasowitz responded to the emails with a series of profane messages. The person sending that email is entitled to his opinion and I should not have responded in that inappropriate manner, Kasowitz said in a statement provided by Siderick on Thursday. I intend to send him an email stating just that. This is one of those times where one wishes he could reverse the clock, but of course I can't. According to the emails, which ProPublica said it had confirmed were authentic, the man had encouraged Gasaitz to resign as Trump's counsel after watching an MSNBC segment referencing ProPublica's earlier report that Gasaitz wasn't seeking a security clearance and may have trouble getting one due to what two dozen sources described to ProPublica as an on-and-off struggle with alcoholism, Siderick denied the alcoholism allegation, despite his role representing the president in Russia investigations, which involves classified material. F. U.
Gasots initially replied. And you don't know me, but I will know you how dare you send me an email like that I'm on you now, he wrote in another email. You're f ing with me now let's see who you are watch your back, b, h. The man thanked Gasots for his kind reply and said he may be in touch as appropriate. Gasots replied in part by calling the man a piece of SHT and insisting I already know where you live while pressing the man to call him. You might as well call me. You will see me, Gasots said. I promise. Bro. The man told ProPublica he forwarded the email chain to the FBI to provide a written record in case Gasots made good on his threat.